For organizers, management teams, and speaker bureaus, there is only one name they think of when they need an expert on customer experience. He goes by the name Stephen Van Belleghem. Now, in addition to being a full-time international keynote speaker, Stephen is also a writer, an author, and a content creator. Recently, he published his sixth business book, A Diamond in a Rough. It immediately skyrocketed on LinkedIn. And I have the pleasure of regularly sharing the stage with Stephen. And I have the feeling that he has an interesting lean work routine and a, a great work ethic, but he hardly ever talks about it. So I'm using this podcast as an excuse to learn more about Stephen van Belhem's backend. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome to the Own Your Story podcast, the place to learn about personality branding, thought leadership, and how to capitalize your reputation. In other words, how to own your story. I'm your host, Janka Vlerakas, former actress, turned into six-figure entrepreneur, author, and keynote speaker. Let's get started. I only know you as a keynote speaker, so take us back to the period when you decided to focus on, on the keynote speaking and, and not what you were doing at the time. So take us back how many years into the past to well, have to go? It was, it was 2012 when I decided to really focus on, um, on being a speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, I was still working at Insights Consulting back then. Um, I launched my first book in 2010, The Conversation Manager, and that was, was quite a hit. And because of that, I ended up in the speaker circuits, uh, first in Belgium, then in the Netherlands, then a little bit international, but mainly Belgium and Holland. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second book came out in 2012, and then I saw that this was really the thing that I, that I liked. I got invitations from nicer stages, nicest, uh, nicer events. So I thought this is what I wanted to do. So I decided to, to stop my job at Insights. I was one of the managing partners there. So I stepped out of the company and, and started to focus on, on speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but in all honesty, ever since I graduated, I've been speaking all the time. I, I started at, uh, at the Vleric Business School. Then I went to Insights. And in both those jobs, I had to present all the time. Mm -hmm. And it, it was funny because in high school, I was a really good presenter. I always had very high grades when we had to give, you know, little presentations in the classroom. But then in university, I completely lost that. I was super, super nervous if I had to present in front of the professors and my, my classmates. So I was shaking like hell and I, I couldn't present anymore. It, was, it why, was game over. And why was that? Did you ever figure out I why? I don't know. I felt uncertain. I thought I wasn't doing a good enough job. I saw that the quality of my co-students was a lot higher than what I was used to in high school. So I felt uncertain. I, I had the feeling that I wasn't good enough. So I, I lost my confidence. And because yeah. of that, the quality went down. And then I started at Vleric. And that was really scary because my professor back then, Rudy Munar, this is his name, he said, Stephen, one of the things you need to do here is teach. Ah, you have a classroom with students. And you have to look for a course and you have to be the teacher of that course. But the funny thing is I graduated in applied economics. And then, you know, the, the guys who did Vleric used to be my co-students. So suddenly I was teaching to them and that was, that was yeah. super, super scary. So I was thrown in the deep, but I prepared myself extremely, extremely well. And, yeah. and it wasn't really a crash and burn. It was an average flight. Um, so I regained my confidence. And then I got the opportunity to start teaching on Friday evening and Saturday morning at Vleco Management School. Mm -hmm. So I did that for years. Um, and that, you know, gave me the opportunity to, to try mm -hmm. out things, do things that, you know, went well, went less good. So I had a lot of flight time before I actually launched yeah. my first book and because be, when, you know, the real deal was happening. Yeah. Now practice is the yeah. main thing when you, when you want to become a, a, yeah. a great keynote speaker. But what I see with clients is that being a teacher or being a keynote speaker, that isn't the same thing. You, no. so you often hear the teaching too much and the inspiration or the motivational part of what you, what you need as a keynote speaker that is often missing when you are teaching too hard. So how did you figure out balance between the two? Um, I don't really know. I, I think it was an evolution. Um, I think at insights, we challenged each other to, you know, we were a marketing research company. Uh, mm -hmm. so usually marketing research presentations are 
the ultimate boring presentations. It's a bunch of graphs. It's hundreds of slides with graphs and you present graph slides after graph after yeah. graph. Sometimes really 300 of those graphs. So I, it was super, super boring. So we start to challenge each other and say, can we make a marketing research presentation without a single graph in it? Just yeah. with visuals and with quotes and yeah. one percentage. And, and I tried to do that and, and we changed the whole game of, of giving presentations. So it's, yeah. it happened along the way. And then you see that if you add some jokes or if you add some metaphors and you try it out, you see that you grab the attention and you think, ah, this is how it works. And, you know, you, you learn by, by doing. Mm -hmm. And, and now I, I don't think I can be a teacher anymore because oh. I, when I see, for instance, a Vleric professor and they see a presentation of me, sometimes I, I give three hours there. And it's three hours in my keynote style. So a thousand slides and they see all this content passing by. And then the Vleric professor that is there, he, he or she tells me, I would do a week over the content that you just <laughs> shared in three hours. And I go doo -doo 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 -doo, one after the other, whereas they spent more time in explaining things. It's a different style, as you mentioned. Yeah. I what do the that. students say? What did, what do they prefer? Both, the I think. I think it's, yeah. Or? Both. It's. I think it's both. Yeah. I. I, yeah. I. I usually get positive evaluations, but I see other people with totally different styles. But when they're really good in teaching, that people mm -hmm. really appreciate that as well. Yeah. We kind of started at the same time with public speaking, but you on stage, me uh, as a coaching people who want to get on stage, and I have the impression that within those ten years, we're um, in the business of of keynote speaking. There's Change, it changed a lot. There are a lot of more keynote speakers now than, than they used to be in 2010, 2014. Mm -hmm. Is that correct or is that just an impression of mine? No, I, I, I think that's right. I think there, were, you know, there weren't too many professional speakers uh, 10 years ago or people who said mm -hmm. we're fully going to focus on, yeah. on that. Um, you have a lot more. I think the majority of the speakers that I meet still do like consulting on the, yeah. not on the side, but as an important part of their business as well. So a lot of them are speakers and advisors at the, at the same time. I think that's the majority. Yeah. But that's not the case with you. You really focus on the speaking, although you still have other clients or. Yeah. Well, I, in 2012, when I left insights, I had the feeling that I would go for speaking and consulting. So I did mm -hmm. for about a year and a half consulting back then, mainly about social media because my, my books were about social media back then. Um, but I felt after a year and a half that, uh, I had less impact with my consulting work than with my speaking work. Okay. I, I felt that when you walk in and I tell them what to do, that people, are like, oh, okay, this is what we need to do. Versus if you give people tools and ideas and they come up with the ideas that they're more excited about it. So mm -hmm. after a year and a half, I, I, I decided to stop doing consulting work mm -hmm. and just focus on speaking. I do a little bit of advisory boards, but not that many, just two yeah. or three um, max per year. Uh, I, I like that if it's an interesting company, but my core focus is speaking. Yeah. And your focus in your content started out with social media, but now it's all about customer experience and customer relationships. It's, um, why, why that shift? And, and it's been for customer experience for a couple of years now. So why are you so hooked on that topic? Well, it, a number of reasons. First of all, it, it happened organically. So I started with the conversation manager, which was really about how to communicate on social media. But mm -hmm. the second book was the conversation company. And if you would look back at that book, basically, it's not a book about conversation about social media. It's a book about customer culture. Um, and it was when I wrote that book that I under understood that it's, it's not the tactics of social media that are the core here, but social media is driving a need for a mm -hmm. higher customer experience. And that, that was my, my focus. And I think it's close to who I am. It's close to my DNA. Um, I always tell the story that I probably got this from my parents who owned like this small photography store in a little town called Maldegem. And they were super customer centric. And every time when we had lunch or dinner, my par I was sitting like in the middle of them and my parents were like ping ponging about how they could help customers in a good way. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was normal. And then when I went to the real world, I understood that it was exceptional what they did. Yeah. So I got, I got customer experience conversations for 18 years every single day. And I think that's, that's why I'm so passionate about it. Yeah. Now your, your most recent book, a diamond in the rough is a book where you 
for the first time, you, I read somewhere that it was the first time you're doing this. You want to explain the how people do it. You want to give more tips, and you even have a workbook um, accompanying yeah. the book. Why? Why now? And why this is the first time? Um, because the question I get most often is how. People are excited. Mm -hmm. uh, they hear a story of the offer you can't refuse. They say, we believe this. this we, we follow your thoughts. But we get stuck during the implementation. And I, when I listen to those stories on how people get stuck, usually, uh, I, in my opinion, the solution is, is often very simple, but they get stuck in, in corporate strange things or a strange way of decision making or politics or uh, KPI management. Mm -hmm. And I thought sometimes it's so simple to do things mm -hmm. better that I was surprised that people didn't see it. So I decided to write everything down that I thought was easy to implement. I've been doing research and speaking and advisory work in this field for 20 years. So I thought this is a good time to bundle all these anecdotes and ideas and theories that I had and share this in this, um, in this new book. Yeah. You do a lot of research and you do, do you do it yourself? All that research. I saw all the examples in the books and oh God, so many research. Yeah. I think 80% of the examples come through me. Um, of course I have the, the privilege that I'm one of the founders of Nextworks. Um, where we organize inspiration trips around the world, mm -hmm. as you know. Uh, we take European executives, we take executives from all over, and we take them to other places for, for inspiration. I do the moderation of about three tours a year. Yeah. Brings me to different locations, shows me a lot of new companies. If I would go through the book, you would see that probably 30% of the examples are inspiration that I found on our Nextworks tours. So for me, that is part of my research, basically, yeah. going on a tour over there. Second thing is... My personal life is one big safari of customer experience. Every interaction that you have with a company can, you know, end up in an anecdote, positive or negative. And then I have uh, a person who is helping me with, with research, coming up with new examples as well. So it's yeah. a combination of, of those three sources. Yeah. So, but going out, not staying in your room, not staying at a stage all the time, but mingle with, with the people network at that point. Uh, at events. So that is an important aspect of your life as well. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, because I've been posting a lot of content and mm -hmm. sharing a lot of content, a lot comes back automatically to me. So oh. every day I have messages on LinkedIn, private messages yeah. where people say, look, this is what happened to me or on Instagram. Look, this is great mm -hmm. or this is bad. And now and then there's an anecdote there that I can really use. Yeah. You already mentioned that uh, that your personal life is full of of, uh, of experiences with customers. So, uh, because your book focuses on small and, and, and bigger companies, I wonder. Okay, these are examples I can do myself as a solopreneur as well. But when and how and and it's so it costs me so much energy. And I'm I'm an introvert when it comes to um, um, relationships and etc. So I, I need a lot of downtown and me town me time mm -hmm. so uh, how do you how do you handle that because it all takes energy if you're working alone it does it does well i'm, I'm not working alone uh, my my wife avi is is also working together with uh, with me so it's the two of us who do mm -hmm. uh most of the work um yeah how do we do it it's it's a combination of promises and efficiency, I think. So I made, you know, in, in my presentations, I talk about non-negotiable rules and non-negotiable rules are like promises that I want to make towards my customers. Mm -hmm. I don't put them on my website, but they're in my mind. It's a promise that I made. And one of those promises is that um, everyone who sends me an email will get a reply within 24 hours. Uh, unless that I'm in a location where there's no Wi-Fi. Sometimes that happens when you're on holiday. So it's like a 99% hit rate. But if you send me an email and if it's a question where I, well, the answer will be no. Uh, sometimes you don't have time for things. And then the answer is no if someone asks for something. But I will write a nice email back and, and see if I can help with, with a video or with a, a blog. So mm -hmm. everyone will get a reply within 24 hours. Um, if people aren't happy with my work, they don't need to pay. Uh, it's one of the wow, yeah. non-negotiable rules. Um, I don't put it in my contract. I don't put it in my website. But if someone would complain and say this was a really bad performance, then there's no invoice. So I have a number of those rules that I formulated for myself. Mm -hmm. 
together with Evie, and and we try to live up to that. Yeah? And we don't always succeed, but I think we're we're doing a an, yeah. a, a good job in that. Yeah. So I yeah. want to deliver a good service. I also think it's important um, that people can talk to me directly. Uh, so everything around the keynotes is done by myself. There's no one in between. If you reply on my website, book a speech, I will mm -hmm. be the one who replies to that. I will do the calls myself. I will make the presentation myself. So everything that is linked to my performance of that keynote from end to end, that communication is done by myself. That's one of the promises I made towards my customers. And you don't have any customers that you, you think, oh, God, I really don't want to talk to this person or this is awful. This is a difficult discussion. No, not that often, in all honesty. Som mm -hmm. Sometimes it happens eh, when you have someone who has uh, strange expectations and mm -hmm. that doesn't understand that you cannot live up to those. I, mm -hmm. I, I always try to be super transparent. If someone says, oh, we have this great opportunity, it's a speech about topic X, but it's it's not close to where my strength is, I will, yeah. I will not do it. And then people say, yeah, but they want you, but it's a different topic. Can't you make something that wouldn't work? I wouldn't deliver um, as, as yeah. I want to deliver. Now and then you have people who don't understand that. And then yeah, that's mm -hmm. not always a pleasant conversation, but usually I don't have that many negative yeah. conversations. Yeah. Let's talk I about, that's right. the good thing about keynote speaking, speaking, uh, you do something if you do a good job, people are happy, they're glad you came, they're very thankful, mm -hmm. and there's no follow-up afterwards with things that you need to do. It's like a, a finished project yeah. at that moment um, yeah. with, with thankful customers is, is my feeling. Yeah, well, that's, that's yeah. maybe the difference between giving keynotes and, and for example, uh, coaching people because yeah. you can deliver your value but the other person has to work with it and has to do something with it and that sure. is out of your control. That is, it is, and that's um, that's not the case when when you're on stage. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. so, so um, your most recent book is your sixth business book. It is, yes. I was counting yesterday, and I, okay, no, <laughs> that was yeah, that was six. fiction. That was that is business. So yeah. um, to me, you're the most consistent. Uh, writer uh, that i know <laughs> who, who is Thank able <laughs> yeah yeah who is able to what I, yeah who is able to write um business books and fiction which is a strange combination i i tried once i i i've written nine books in several genres so um but writing a novel is not my thing so mm -hmm. combining the novel writing and writing of a business book that was Whoa, that was exciting for me to see mm -hmm. how you wanna how you're gonna tackle that, mm -hmm. and you did that unbelievably good. So go through the the process of writing a book because you're very focused. I have the impression you're very planned mm -hmm. out. So please talk about that. Yeah, well, usually um, the process starts a year before the book comes out, um, and that's for me the the hard work where I try to first come up with a central topic and then see what are you know hypotheses what are elements what are dimensions to you know make it something that has some meat on the bone and as soon as i have that i start with a word file and i start to make my first content like my structure of a book like this part 1 part 2 chapter 1 up, 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 with some bullets and then i i leave it there for like a, a month Mm -hmm. And then in the meantime, I get new inspiration. I see new things. I, I try things out in a presentation about a month later. I do the same thing. I don't look at my first file, but I start with a brand new empty page oh. in Word mm -hmm. and I make a new structure and, and just seeing what, what, what works this time. And then I compare both. And usually there are differences. And then mm -hmm. say, ah, I forgot this. I can still use it, but at a different moment. And I do that like four or five months in a row, that same exercise. And usually then I have like a format or a structure that I think, all right, this is starting to make sense. And once I have that and I have a good feeling about that, then my goal is to, you know, create models, come up with cases that fit in the different chapters. Okay. And I put them there. And once I have that, I start to write like two or three sentences per bullet point. Summary, kind of summary. It, yeah, yeah, just th that I know what the key message is. And I, I keep doing that for, for months until I have the feeling like, all right, this 
this is it. And then I have like a word file of 20 pages on average. Mm -hmm. And that is basically my book structure. Yeah. And at that point, I'm ready to, to write. And then about 80% of the writing really fix, fits in that, uh, in that structure. And sometimes I have a chapter that I think, oh my God, I thought I had this, all this content here. And after half a page, I'm completely done with all my ideas. So I have to stud, restudy. And then mm -hmm. I focus only on that chapter, really go for a walk and think about, all right, what do I want to say? How does it really work? Try to come up with a model of structure again. And then I, I restart. And, and, and that's it. Yeah. And, do you have... and the writing itself goes really fast. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's once, uh, once you're at that point, it's just yeah, like once at that point, it's in my head. Yeah. And I already tried ev almost everything out in a presentation. So yeah. I've said it like 30 or 40 times. And then I just type it type what is in my mind, basically. So just like a, a stand up comedian tries his uh, new jokes on uh, yes. an audience in an, in an older presentation, you do the same. I do the same. I never have a completely new presentation anymore. I did that in the past, but it doesn't work because your quality isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. But I have new elements new that I elements. place into it. Yeah. And then I feel the difference, but the audience doesn't. Yeah. At least that's what I think. <laughs> so, and do you have, do you have, um, do you work on, on the same day every week or it doesn't matter when you write, you can write on a plane, you can write whatever you're up to it, or do you really plan out your uh, writing sessions? I plan it, but it's not a fixed moment. Basically, mm -hmm. it's my core job that is the center of my agenda, which means keynotes, getting there, the calls, um, preparation of that, that is my backbone of my work. And then I plan the writing yeah. in between. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. underestimate how much work you have when you're presenting a keynote they think you know, you you just come and talk for an hour so they don't realize the work that has to be done up front even mm -hmm. when you have your keynote you still have to work on it and change things or put some new elements in it how much time do you still take does it take to still change your keynote even though it's already made like the one you are giving now oh. so you're giving it two times and it's it's yeah, almost the same every time. Do you still work on it or do you change things? I, I do. Like this morning, um, I woke up at 6.30, uh, had some breakfast. And then at 7, I started to work on presentations for, for this week, for this afternoon and yeah. the others this, uh, this week. And I completely changed my introduction um, this morning because I thought I want to do something else and this feels better. Mm -hmm. You know, I had two weeks off with, with, uh, holidays. So suddenly I had an idea and I said, well, today I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna do it differently. Yeah. And it's, it's an ongoing process. Uh, I do try out new things. Sometimes I use exactly the same uh, when I have two customers that ask exactly the same, that's, that's, that's a win. Uh, then you can use exactly the same, but usually people say, Oh, we want to have this accent or this accent. And of course I have a lot of building blocks, mm -hmm. but I think if you would look at the slides that I have now versus three months ago, like with the new book, I have, let's say a thousand slides that I can mm -hmm. work with. 200 of them are brand new in the last two or three months. Yeah. yeah. And so in three months from now, I will have 100 or 200 brand new ones again. Yeah. yeah. So it's always work in progress. Now, what it do is, you, it is. yeah. yeah. Uh, how many keynotes a week do you, give on average depends on location um like this week is five um next week i don't know by heart but when i go to the us for instance it's it's maybe two a week because yeah. you have all the traveling mm -hmm. that you that you do but i think on average three to four yeah wow yeah 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 you should be disciplined and and keeping your workouts well do you work out Walking and swimming is what I yeah. do. Um, but to be honest, when it's raining, like it has been in the last few months, no. <laughs> I I've, I've didn't do a good job there. I, no, I went no. out yesterday. It was, it was, you know, no rain. It was freezing yeah. cold. That doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Um, and I need to have time. 
Uh, but when I'm in the city or when I'm in a hotel, I try to, I do the cross trainer in the, yes. in the gyms yeah. or I go for a walk when it's nice weather. That's, yeah. that's, yeah, that's what I like to do. Yeah. So we already discussed your writing, your keynote speaking, and uh, now it's, it's up to the social media part of this conversation okay. because you're really a consistent poster. You're there. Um, mm -hmm. Every every week, I see several posts. You you repurpose your content, so it's interesting for me to find out what is your content creation machine. Um, how do you how do you plan? How do you create? Uh, and uh, let's yeah let's let's start with talking about the uh, the weekly video on YouTube, which you've done for years, and which was to me yeah. the start of your, really your presence on social media. Yeah, well, I started with, with with YouTube in 2014 with, let's say, more traditional videos where I say things and then hope that people will like it. It took off very slowly, um, maybe 100 views per, per video. And then I started with that concept called it Stephen's Week, in which I made a very simple kind of video. I filmed it with my iPhone everywhere I was. And then I said, this is the news of the week in like a three to five minute video, maybe three or four items so that people could in a few minutes be up to speed about everything that happened in in my world. Um, so I always looked for the content. I made the video sometimes in my car, sometimes when I was on the road, sometimes just at home. And I, I shared those individual videos to Snack Bites, which was a social media agency that I started together with Sam Bertelot. Yeah, somewhere in 2015 or so, I don't exactly remember. And the team there made the video then, you know, with the little bumpers in between, and they posted that on my on my YouTube channel. That's how we organized that. And I've done that for seven years, a weekly weekly video. Mm -hmm. And it, it yeah, it was quite a success. Um, but then I, I I didn't find the energy anymore to do it, in all honesty, but I still wanted to share things. So I changed the, the format a bit and I now have a monthly CX update video, which is more content uh, based, mm -hmm. not news based. And um, with two or three, max four topics uh, a month. And basically I do that myself right here where I'm now behind me. I have a green key. I film it. I do the editing myself um, and snack by still post it on my, on my YouTube uh, that I, I sent a video yeah. to them, but I do the editing myself of that one. Yeah. Do you, do you do the editing of your reels also? Because I see you TikTok wise no. with all the flashing uh, elements, etc. No, because... and the and the videos that are really yeah. cool made, like my I don't know if you saw my CX trends for twenty twenty four. That's my my designer who makes that. I, yeah. I, I don't I yeah, don't have a clue how to do that. I don't have the time. I mean, it's, it's, it's the I'm, time. I'm I think you will you can find out how to do it, but it takes a lot I don't of know. time. And to... you need to creative insight. So, and mm -hmm. he's really good at it. The reels, all my social media content, all my slides are made by a designer. Mm -hmm. I do the the rough imaging, and that's really rough if you would see it. And then yeah. Yeah, he makes uh, he makes me look beautiful and professional yeah. on the stage and TikTok. And Instagram. And TikTok, yeah. And Instagram, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with, uh, you know, the CX stories that we share every yeah. week. With uh, Every week we have, like, two times a quote and then a story. Um, yeah, he makes those those as well. Yeah. yeah. My husband uh, said this weekend when I was checking the posts I created for LinkedIn, he said, don't you get tired of seeing yourself all the time? <laughs> <laughs> like, so uh, I've been seeing, I'm watching myself for about 30 or 50 years now um always on tv etc but do, don't you yeah, get tired yeah. of of seeing of working with yourself and seeing yourself online and and uh, building that but there's no brand. one else who, who sees our content more than ourselves so we see <laughs> we see everything <laughs> yeah. huh? the good news is is that not everyone sees everything i think they would yeah. go crazy um uh, the challenge that I have is sometimes thinking about new things and, you know, the, the rhythm is so high mm -hmm. that you always have to come up with new things. And sometimes I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be out of ideas. Mm -hmm. And especially when you have a new book, there's a lot of ideas that you can work with. Like now the, the CX tips, we use the 100 tips from the book and yeah. do a week. So for a year, that's Instagram content. So that's, that's really cool. But I'm like, what are we going to do after that? I mean, I'm, I'm out of tips. I'm out of ideas. I share everything I know in this new story and we're sharing that. But within a year, 
I'm going to be out of content. So that's yeah, always my feeling. I'm going to be out of content. Stephen, people forget. You think so? <laughs> so we start all over. We yeah. start all over again, <laughs> but with other videos, etc. But how do you take care yeah. of yourself? Because self care is is very important when you when um, when you're going that fast and then and, and it's always it's always working it's always producing and publishing mm -hmm. just how how do you manage your self-care yeah that's a good question and usually I'm, I'm fortunate that i have a lot of energy i can i can have quite a stamina to keep on going mm -hmm. and i usually get a lot of positive energy if things work out well but this fall was really hard um in a in a positive way because the new book really took off i got a lot of yeah. really positive feedback we we sold a lot of books, a lot of keynotes internationally. I've been everywhere from Japan to Dubai to the States to Africa. I was extremely busy, but by the time it was Christmas, I was really happy that there was a, a break. And, and Christmas holiday is my favorite of all for the simple reason that we, we have great family moments and then we usually do a, a nice holiday. And there's hardly any emails that come to you during Christmas holiday. The yeah. entire world yeah. is not working. So yeah. this is the calmest week of the year. And mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. And and this, this is what I need. The moments that I am not posting, I'm not producing, mm -hmm. I'm not speaking. And basically I do research. Um, mm -hmm. But let's say 70% of all school holidays, I don't produce content. Uh, I don't yes. share content. Uh, I don't care about it and uh, I let go of things and I, yes. I need that to get the battery back up because yeah. I, I wouldn't have the stamina just to go at the same pace 365 days a year. That yeah. wouldn't, that so, just wouldn't work. Yeah. Thanks to the kids. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> thanks to the, the kids. children yeah. still at, at school that, that does uh, school holidays work so well. Yeah. I did that for uh, many years as well, but my kids have, have grown out of uh, high school now. Okay. So. What are your plans? Uh, final question. What are your plans for 2024? What new things would you like to try out? <laughs> this is going to be a boring answer. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't it. have, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have anything new, exciting planned in all honesty. I've, I've written five books, uh, uh, yeah, five books in three years, in four years. Uh, 2020 to mm -hmm. 2023 so yeah four years five books um a lot of new stuff a lot of new experiments and i decided 2024 i'm just gonna use the things that i have right now i'm gonna work mm -hmm. with the diamond in the rough i'm super excited about that i think there's a lot of work that can be done in that field mm -hmm. i hope to be speaking at a lot of wonderful conferences and that's going to be my my yeah. core focus to make yeah. my presentations better this year all right and on a personal level yeah. On a personal level, I um, hope that we're going to have great family moments, um, that we can continue to show our children nice places in the world, that we can build good memories. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the focus. That's what I hope for. Okay. Thank you for being my guest, Stefan. With great pleasure. It was a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>